Welcome to episode 150. Wow. Today we have a very, very special guest. I might never have reached out to her if not for the request of my friend Melissa, who asked that I invite Penny and gave me the courage to do so. So thank you, Melissa. Now, whether you're here for the first time or joining for the 150th time, I'm so delighted that you're here to talk about creativity in the ELA classroom with us. And I think you're going to absolutely love learning with Penny Kittle today. Let me give you some background on her amazing career, and then we'll jump into the conversation. Penny Kittle teaches freshman composition at Plymouth State University in New Hampshire. She was a teacher and a literacy coach in public schools for 34 years, 21 of those spent at Kennett High School in North Conway. She is the co-author of 180 Days with Kelly Gallagher and the author of Book Love and Right Beside Them, which won the James Britton Award. She also co-authored two books with her mentor, Don Graves, and co-edited with Tom Newkirk, a collection of Graves' work called Children Want to Write. She is the president of the Book Love Foundation and was given the Exemplary Leader Award from NCTE's Conference on English Leadership. In the summer, Penny teaches graduate students at the University of New Hampshire Literacy Institutes. Throughout the year, she travels across the U.S. and Canada, and once in a while, quite a bit further, speaking to teachers about empowering students through independence in literacy. She believes in curiosity, engagement, and deep thinking in schools for both students and their teachers. Penny stands on the shoulders of her mentors, the Dons, Murray and Graves, and the Toms, Newkirk and Romano, in her belief that intentional teaching in a reading and writing workshop brings the greatest student investment in learning in a classroom. Wow, are you as excited as I am? Now, on to the show. Hey there, I'm your host, Betsy Potash, and one-pagers, project-based learning, and choice reading are my jam. I believe in you, and my goal is to help you explore all the creative possibilities you dream of for your classroom. I'm an educator, a chocolate cake aficionado, a traveler who can't wait to get back to Barcelona, and the kind of mom who brings her own mini makerspace to her kid's classroom when she comes to volunteer. I know this for sure, creativity isn't always easy. As a creative teacher, you get parent calls you treasure, and plenty of sidelong comments you'd rather forget. But here's the bottom line. Creative education can ignite a spark in your students and change their lives forever. You and I know this. You're an innovator. And while it's sometimes hard, it's so worth it. So let's explore the world of creative education together. Welcome to the Spark Creativity Teacher Podcast. Well, Penny, I couldn't be more delighted about this chance to talk to you. As I've prepared for this interview, I have just felt more and more connected to your work and more and more excited about interviewing you, which has actually made this a bit of a nerve-wracking week because there's just so much that I'm eager to dive into. And so narrowing down my questions was a really, truly fun challenge. Um, But I know that I'm going to link to just... 8 million things in the show notes today, and I'm just going to delight in whatever we talk about. So welcome to the show. Thank you. I love that uh, way to think about our work together today, right? We're just going to have a wonderful experience chatting, and then we'll see where it takes us. Yeah, yeah. It's an adventure unknown. (laughs) Well, as I've explored your work, one theme that has really stuck out to me that I wanted to start with today is the bravery with which you say to things in education that are not working, that you reject them. I am so with you on that. And I think <laughs> at, <laughs> at the same time, it can be so hard. I mean, you you taught in public schools where you had standards and you had curriculum maps and you had checklists and testing and And you found a way to push back and do what you truly believed in. And that's where I want to start today, because I think so many teachers want that and want to follow in your footsteps on that, but they don't know how. So can can we start there? (laughs) Yeah, let's start with a really easy question. Yeah, yeah. Let's start with the revolution. (laughs) Um, Okay, so 34 years I was working in public schools and I was in six different states here in the U.S. um, following my husband's work. And so I had a lot of time to experience school from different lenses and to see that oftentimes when you're in one school, it feels like that's the way school is done. And then as you move around, 
you begin to see that they, these are decisions that people are making about how to treat children and how to approach the teaching of reading and writing. And so what I found most helpful for me is that, number one, I understood my beliefs from the beginning, and I always have centered my classrooms on the children I'm teaching. You know, there are names for it, like responsive teaching. You respond to the students in the room, not just teaching curriculum, but teaching them. And so that has always driven me to look for solutions, to look at what's not working, to listen really closely to my students and um, to design programs and ways of being in the work that help them all find what brings them joy and makes them want to keep reading and writing, right? The ultimate yeah. goal that they are inspired to want to keep working at their reading and writing. So that meant that I, um, especially moving grade levels, began to question like why those four books in ninth grade, right? Mm -hmm. That was one of my first big, well, there were many, but one of the first big conflicts I had when I moved into eighth grade in our new town here, when we moved to New Hampshire, I was handed the grammar book and my department chair came to me and said, I don't see your kids carrying that. And I said, oh, they won't be carrying that. But it was a repeat of a, an, um, I wouldn't say an argument, but just a confrontation I'd had at the school I had left in Washington state where um, the principal asked to talk to me one day and, and I adored her. And she said, I've just had a question about why um, your students aren't practicing exercises out of the grammar textbook. And I said, oh, well, let me just, and I flipped to a page, a random page, and I don't remember what the rule was, but I said, could you tell me what this is? And she looked at me, she was painting her fingernails. It was so funny. She was painting her fingernails and she stopped and she looked at me and she said, I don't think I could define that. I said, okay, just, just stay with me. <laughs> do you know what it means to use it in writing? And she was like, no. And she's starting to smile. And I said, <laughs> all I'm saying is that if you who are an accomplished and very organized, thoughtful writer have no use for this, then why would I be teaching it to 13 year olds? And she, you know, had observed me enough to know that I believed wholeheartedly in students gaining the skills and the knowledge they needed to write well, but I just wasn't going to waste their time following someone else's program. So when I came here and got the same basic <laughs> argument, my department chair, I was prepared because I'd had it before. And I said, listen, I'd love to have you in. I'd love to have longer conversations about grammar in the context of teaching writing. It's something I study. It's something I read about. Um, and, you know, prepared me. And you can tell all these were low level, um, like department chair often conflicts before mm -hmm. they went to the administration. And at the high school, when I started teaching ninth grade, I said, wait, my eighth graders were reading on average 30 to 40 books each, and you've given me four. And so first question is why these four? Yeah. You know, and mm -hmm. she was so offended by my question. I said, I'm not trying to deny that these aren't classic, you know, texts. I'm just simply asking, what is our process of looking at where ninth graders are? Because I had honors ninth graders and eight of the 10 in the first class I had, because it was a tiny group, I had had in eighth grade. I said, I can't imagine going to them and saying, okay, all that stuff we did last year, <laughs> it doesn't matter what you want to read. I'm making all the choices. So yeah, I would just, I would always approach what you think is going to be a conflict with deeply trying to understand where things come from. Because, you know, if you're going to challenge something, you want to know where it resides and in the belief system of the person that you're talking to, but also how research supports what you're talking about. You know, there was already deep research into the value of book clubs and no one was using them in my middle or my high school. And so for me to say, hey, I have this article that I would love to read with other people and think about how we might try using book clubs to capitalize on the social engagement of kids at this age. Yeah. So you come into those conversations with empathy and with confidence and with research. Yeah, and I try to remind myself to be humble especially with, um, you know, in, when I moved to the high school, that was my first experience teaching high school. Yeah. And so I wanted, you know, to remember that 
they had been in high school teaching for a while, this group of people that I was working with, and they knew things that I didn't know. Yeah. But I also thought it was legitimate for teachers to ask questions of practice of each other. And um, many of the books that I referenced or had been reading, um, especially Donald Murray, who was a you know first year university professor writing about the teaching of writing, hmm. certainly um, could be applied to the high school. You know, you didn't have to just look back and say, well, that was middle school. You know, Nancy Atwell, Linda Reef, those people only, you know, yeah. kind of discounting them. I could say, well, OK, but what if we all read something by Donald Murray? And in fact, um, we did as a department read one of his books. I love that. So you were switching from your middle school to the high school level. And it seems like at that point you really kind of... Um, began to define and formulate this approach to reading that has become so definitive for you. You know, you have your the Book Love Foundation, your your books about um, cho- including more choice reading, all the wonderful interviews I've heard from you lately about um, bringing modern voices into the hands of our children. And I just want to ask you, let's walk through a little... Um, imagined situation. A student arrives in your classroom, your high school classroom, who is feeling pretty apathetic about reading. He's kind of over books. He's he's had a lot of recommendations and he's read three pages and put them away and he's just not into it. And I love how you and Kelly talk in 180 days about how you're not going to meet a kid like that and say, here's a 200 page whole class read. Here's Shakespeare. We're going to start with that. You're, you're just not going to lead him back into reading that way. So how would you lead a disaffected reader back into reading? I feel like following that journey would give everybody listening such a good um, understanding of, of your beliefs around reading. Hmm. Well, um, the first thing is that most students who are not interested in reading haven't had that experience with the book in so long that they've forgotten the way it can grab you and name things that are in your heart, in your mind that you didn't realize perhaps that you were wrestling with, but all of a sudden they're in a a story and you feel for the characters, you feel for yourself and you can't stop reading. That's what I hear. Many, many, many kids will say, Mm -hmm. I hadn't read in so long, and then I just couldn't put this book down. And in fact, I had a colleague, she was um, 10 years in the international schools, and she was a former student at our high school, and she came back to teach at our high school. And she was apprehensive. She'd done a lot of the work in the IB programs. And, you know, I I, I really like what you're saying, but I'm not sure. And started with independent reading and she had a boy who, to, as far as she could tell, had never read a book and was kind of stumbling along slowly through a book. And she came up to me one day in the hall and she said, it happened for me. And I said, what? And she said, he walked in with that look in his eyes. And I will never forget that look as he said, we've got to talk about this book. She said it was the engagement. It was that thing you talk about when you say that once you have a kid who's truly turned on to what has happened in that book and happened with him, he's never going to look away. He's going to keep looking for another book like that one. And there are so many. And she said, I just didn't quite believe you (laughs) until he walked in my classroom this morning. And that's what I remind my students of. But it isn't enough to just tell kids about books because we've been telling them about books forever. And so what I brought from my, you know, experience as a middle school teacher into my high school classroom was time to read. And it's a short time to read, but it's time to read so I can confer with them. Book talks every day with a next list in the back of their notebook where they can collect, well, I might want to read that. You know, if I finish something and looking for something else, that's a book I might want to pick up. That idea of ownership, 15 minutes a day, of time to read when I confer with kids. And it's that that leads kids to understand there are so many interesting books in the world and so many that will reach um, their own ideas and beliefs. You know, I'm book talking from hunting and fishing literature. I'm book talking (laughs) from gang 
collections and memoirs and collections of poetry, you know, Jay-Z's notebooks and books on basketball that are, you know, this wonderful collection of basketball players and all of their um, successes as well as their struggles. And there's just always going to be something we can find to put in a kid's hand. And in class, every table has a pile of books on it. And those are for what I call speed dating. So if you arrive in class and you've lost interest in your book, you get a chance, you know, it's just a date. It's not a relationship, right? You just spend <laughs> with that book and you may say, oh, I kind of, you know, this guy, that's, he's somebody that I want to read about. Or you say, nah, give me something else. And I'm of course aware of what's happening, right? So I'm conferring here, but I'm looking across the room and there's Jake who's abandoned every book consistently for the last four weeks or just looks like, uh, when will this 10 minutes end? <laughs> I'm going to make sure I get over there and say, Hey, talk to me. How are you? What's happening? Yeah. Well, how can I make this better? You know, I remember a kid saying to me, Miss Kittle, there are just so many words on the page. He was reading American Sniper. And I said, um, what, have you ever listened to an audio book? You could listen to the audio, follow along when you wanted to, but have you ever experienced a book like that and he hadn't and so I downloaded it and he would sit there with my iPad listening to it mm -hmm. while he was also sometimes looking at the book not always but that idea of any way we can bring story that engages that kid and what we have to remember is the making of meaning from the book is the most important thing you know Kyleen Beers said years ago that a book is like a barbell on the floor of a gym, right? It doesn't matter how much it weighs. It doesn't matter if you tell them this is the greatest classic of all time if they don't pick it up and do something with it. Mm -hmm. And I would add to that that watching other people lift weights never makes you any stronger. <laughs> so a kid sitting in class and he's watching everybody else read or talk about a book and he didn't read it and he can follow along and he can spit back facts about the book or tell you a little bit of what he learned, he's not getting any stronger as a reader. He's just watching everybody do the work. And so we want to get all the kids lifting. And that means that you get them making meaning from a text without any help from anyone else. Certainly we can intervene and, you know, how's it going? And the kid says, I don't have any idea what this is about. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my goodness. So when did you last know what was happening? Right. Mm -hmm. And you problem solve with them. Well, this is what I use as a reader. Everybody does that. You zone out and you go, wait, what did I just do? <laughs> but you have to approach it as, um, everyone is going to find joy in reading. I absolutely believe it. I tell my students that you're a project for me. You've never loved reading. I love this challenge. You're, you know, I'm going to be thinking about you when I'm not in class. And the sad truth I'm sure, you know, is that we have more kids who don't read than ever. Yeah. And I'm dismayed that sometimes the answer is to continue to do exactly what we've always done. I mean, and I am with the people listening who feel trapped by that. Yeah. You know, that revolution thing you started with, it is hard to be the one who's not going along. Um, but I also set goals and promise myself to come up with um, real live data from our kids that I could share with other people you know, and interviewed my students and would bring those interviews to people who asked or were curious. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's so powerful. I tried to do that a little bit myself when I first discovered Nancy Atwell, I was teaching overseas in Bulgaria and none of my students read books in English for fun ever. And we got going with choice reading and they read um, over 10,000 pages, these two classes in, in 30 days while I was tracking. And I was just like, how can you argue with this? <laughs> I mean, this yeah. is, this is mind boggling. None of them had read a single English book for fun the whole year until I rolled out my dusty armfuls of books from the attic library and started book talking them all and started taking time in class. And all of a sudden, one of the kids wants me to call him Ender because <laughs> he's reading Ender's Game and he's obsessed. And, you know, just so many yeah. wonderful things are happening. Well, and I think, you know, don't you want to just sit for a minute and think about that word fun 
And think about it in two different ways. One is that most of us don't do a lot of what we don't enjoy. Mm -hmm. We'll do it reluctantly. We'll do it because we have to do it. But that doesn't mean that when as soon as the have to is over, we run and do it again, right? Mm -hmm. So there is some sense of pleasure. Nancy Atwell said to Kelly, (laughs) visited her. What is it with Americans in the P word? And we're both looking at each other like, what? She goes, pleasure. Everybody seems to have a problem with the word pleasure. Mm-hmm. And, and I think there's that, but there's also most of the time, my students are not choosing books of pleasure. They enjoy reading, but they are challenging themselves to read about opioid addiction because their cousin died of it, or to read about suicide because they're afraid for someone they know or they know other kids who talk about it, they they don't read for fun. They read like all of us for information. Mm. They read to challenge themselves. They read for um, a deeper understanding of something they're curious about or in love with, like writing songs so that all of a sudden they're reading Jeff Tweedy, how to write a song, right? Yeah. For their mm. own purposes and their own passions. Oh, that's so lovely. I always get inspired when I see the way that you find these different things for students to read. You find these columns from sources that I don't know about, these performance pieces, these these incredible um, pieces of nonfiction alongside all of these current modern voices that you continue to add to the collection for students. Can we talk a little bit about how you have become a... Um, what's the word, just like a master collector of words. <laughs> <laughs> and then how you use them, not just to inspire reading, but also to inspire writer's craft. Yeah, that's, you know, that's a really good question because I would say, first of all, my students are so good at finding good things, <laughs> right? So a lot of the things that I talk about, students showed me before I showed teachers. Oh, and um, there, for example, I always play music as kids are arriving and a couple of boys came in, um, this fall and said, Miss Kittle, really enough with the T-Swift. <laughs> but I love Taylor Swift. <laughs> right? and they give me this playlist <laughs> and pretty soon I'm putting the lyrics up on our, um, notebooks inspirations page because that's the thing, right? We want to be in the world that they are experiencing. And so, for example, we did um, screen time one time, just took, you know, swipe left on our phones, copy down how much time we're spending on our phones and on what. Mm. And then we watched this great piece from the New York Times because I read that all the times, you know, and so I found this digital text on the no good, very bad truth of what's on the internet. Mm. And so then that led us to do some quick writing next to that. Now, I think that the the collector of things, I read all of the time, right? I'm the one that is reading a book while I'm waiting actually for the podcast to start. (laughs) Because I'm always reading and thinking, and then how can I possibly use this? Mm. So students, my own reading, collecting life, and probably the other source is... um, I just have this great blessing in my life of going to conferences, oftentimes because I'm presenting, but because of that, I get to listen to other people. And I listen to Ernest Morell talk about digital work he's doing at Notre Dame, and I'm amazed at all of the resources he links me to. So it's collecting and sharing and trying them out. Um, I have three poetry sites that I get a poem a day from. And sometimes I'm just deleting them. I don't even have time to read them, (sighs) but they're a constant source of, oh, there's one. Yes. I love that. Well, now that we're kind of making this transition over into writing, you mentioned these quick writes. um, And that was something that, that I thought was really interesting, all the writing alongside text that you do. But before we even get into that, I want to do another one of these um, kind of journeys with a student. So we did the disaffected reader. Now let's do the disaffected writer. You've got a writer coming in 
And she's a talented student. She gets straight A's. She writes all the five paragraph essays that all of her teachers ask her to write. And then she moves on with her life. (laughs) She's not writing for joy. She's not into writing. She doesn't really know what makes writing come alive. She just kind of knows how to check the boxes on the rubric. What would her journey be like as a writer in your classroom? Mm. Well, um, since I've moved to the university two days a week now, I meet all of those kids every late August and they have all arrived there because they got good grades in high school and almost without, I mean, I think every single one of them this fall, they don't like writing. They don't believe they're good writers they almost have already decided that all of that fake practice that they did made them good at one thing and it's not real writing, right? Because kids are like all of us. They're in the world. They're watching, you know, their favorite shows. They're listening to podcasts. They're watching um, TED Talks or TikToks or where people are speaking Mm -hmm. and they don't have confidence in how they speak. Well, that's all based on writing, right? And so, When they come in in the fall and I say to them things like, okay, so we're going to have writer's notebooks and every day in class, we're going to write next to something like today, we're going to write next to something you should know about me is as a kid, I once by Clint Smith and I show them the poem, important things about this practice. Number one, you can't do it wrong. Number two, if you don't have anything to write, then you could sketch, you could list, you could, there is no grade for doing some particular thing exactly the way I want you to do it. What we're here for is to find your voice and to find what you think about things. And sometimes we practice directly next to a text we're imitating because we're learning a skill, but most of the time, this notebook is completely yours. And I'm gonna ask you to write as much as you can and then to reread it and make it a little better every single day you're with me. So never show up at class without your writer's notebook because we're gonna use it every day. I, you know, it's the first week and you look around the room and I know they're all trying to, you know, do what I asked them to do that first week, but you see the way kids engage, the hesitations, the, the challenge that writing is when nobody has told you exactly what that finished product is supposed to be, right? And we want our kids to wrestle with that a little bit. No, so you're gonna write a proposal for X and here's your audience, but there's no information on how to do that well. Should I start with a story? Should I? That is what college writing looks like for kids. Mm -hmm. Read this and write about what you value about what the author had to say. And the students are like, well, I don't know, but how how do I start that? What does it look like? Yeah. And it's a thousand word essay, right? So it's preparing them for not only how, um, what we want to read as readers is writing that's clear and cohesive and thoughtful and filled with life. It has a voice, it has a person. And so to do that, you can't practice a formula or a um, five paragraph, anything. You have to begin figuring out what you're trying to say by writing. That's the best way to get there. Figuring out that a whole bunch of it you don't need anymore. So (laughs) notebooks is number one. Notebooks is the daily practice. I'm under the document camera in my notebook, struggling with something just as they're all writing. And they're really not that interested in in what's happening in my notebook. You know, they'll glance up once in a while or I'll use it as a teaching tool that day. And then we go from there to studying a text together and the quick writing leading to, okay, talk about what you notice this writer doing in this essay. And at first they say all of the the labels that they've learned, right? Mm -hmm. They'll say things like, you know, well, there's a flashback, but I'll say, that's fine that you can name it, but it's more important you tell me why the author chose it and what that craft does in the piece. So what, what's the purpose of it? And so they begin to develop these lists of craft moves they notice and want to try out. And um, what I find is that they begin to make that connection that we know about between reading and writing. The more you read, the better you write because you have more options. You understand craft because writers use all kinds of techniques, but you see how they all come together, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, I never thought 
list as a craft move, but now I totally get what a list does, <laughs> right? And how to order a list and what to do with that in a first paragraph and even in within one sentence. So I find writing endlessly fascinating. And so I try to bring that to class. And of course, the whip share at the end of quick writing um, is really critical because it's share a line, a phrase, a passage, or pass. And I whip around the room and call on every kid. Not only because I name every kid, you know, just that is so significant that every kid every day hears their name in class and I'm, you know, thanks, yeah. Jake, that was awesome. Or we all snap, you know, but <sighs> again and again, we'll say, I just had no idea there were so many ways to respond to the same poem. I had no idea that other people had these stories that were similar to mine or had said something that I was like, wait, I know exactly what he's talking about. And they named that this fall more than anything else as an important community building piece in our class. Our students are traumatized like all of us by being quarantined and separated at a most incredible time in their lives. Mm. To be back in a room with other people and to hear their stories and fears and losses and joys is powerful. So that quick couple minutes of whip share is just such a way to help kids gain some confidence. You know, one of my students at the end of the semester said, Every single day, Miss Kittle, I would say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share today. And you'd come to me and I'd go pass. <laughs> and he goes, I'm proud of myself that I finally read something from my notebook. Oh, right? Yeah. That's just powerful. And so other times I'll just slide a kid's notebook under the doc camera, of course, with permission, and say, I just want to take a minute and show you what Emma did here. And then ask Emma to tell the class, you know, where it came from. Because as the more we lift up what they're doing, the more they gain confidence. And that's our most important tool in getting them all to take ownership for what they're doing as writers. Yeah. So writing notebooks. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to ask you kind of a follow-up on the writing notebook. One of the concepts that I really was interested in from 180 Days was the idea of writing laps. And, you know, a lot of them, it seems like start in the notebook, but then you have this way of weaving, um, different types of writing throughout the year in laps. Can you, can you talk a little bit about what that means? Yeah. Well, I have this amazing colleague. He's still at the high school and we chat once in a while. Um, and I remember because we were a professional learning community of two for years, the only one. <laughs> teaching seniors at our high school. And I taught them for 15 years. And I remember I came in one day and I said, ah, oh, look at where he is. And I had this essay in my hand. I said, this kid, he just needs another lap around the track. Like he's almost there. And Ed was like, exactly right. These kids need another lap around this track. And the track was personal narrative essay. Well, when you teach seniors, you know that college admissions essay, which is a personal narrative is this looming, enormously important um, piece. And it was early October. Our kids were starting to you know, put together their early apps. And we gave them one more lap. Okay, hey, you guys, let's do this again. But this time, look at what you've accomplished and what are the things you didn't quite get to. And they went after it again, the same assignment, so to speak, the same form or genre. Yeah in a new way. And that was the basis of what became in 180 days, the idea of teach them a scene, which is how I'd always started teaching narrative, teach them the qualities of a scene and have everybody write a scene that has those qualities, then teach them how several scenes put together, create an essay or a moment or a story. And then how you might order those scenes, you might start with a flashback, you might and the idea that you are always in charge of these building blocks like Plato in your hands. And as you, you know, if you give them feedback on that first lap, just a scene, they've got more information for writing several scenes. Mm -hmm. And then when you give them feedback on the several scenes, they have a greater understanding of how to make the whole more effective in their last lap. And doing that with argument, you know, we practiced quick writing, arguing next to big issues of the day. You know, a coach got fired for using the F word in the locker room. 
should he have been fired? And they all write quickly next to that question. And boy, you know, it gets kind of raucous in the room, you know, whether or not that's, but that's what you want is, okay, what's the sound and the language that we use in argument? And how do we moderate our tone when we're really impassioned? And how do we, all of those moves, you'd build them into quick writing. We argue right every day in class when we're in an argument unit. And we find that that we're refining those skills, both in a very safe practice, low stakes, ungraded writing notebook, and then as we're perfecting these pieces for assignments. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that kind of brings me into the emphasis that you place on narrative within a writing curriculum. And I was just nodding along so hard as you were talking about how students don't end up writing that much literary criticism in their later life, but they do use these elements of scenes and narrative throughout so many types of writing. So can we talk a little bit about how you center narrative as, as a part of your writing instruction? Yeah. So, uh, one of my early mentors, Tom Newkirk is really the influence of so much of that because, um, he actually was the editor on Book Love, and we wrote together, um, edited the collection of Graves' work. And now um, he's still someone that uh, he even came to my birthday party recently, a surprise party. Aww. But he wrote a book called Minds Made for Stories. And it's a Heinemann book that um, I'm just looking it up here. 2014 was when it came out. And even though as in the years before my students had always written a lot of story, um, what he emphasizes there is that calling narrative informational argument as these um, categories of writing, that using narrative in that way was a category error because narrative is the way we all think and learn, cause and effect. We um, frame our lives beginning, middle, end. We, it is actually separate from the way we think about informational texts and argument texts. And that since narrative holds such a central place in the way humans have always interpreted the happenings in their world, right? I remember um, the hands on the caves, right? And that that was as explained in To Read or Not to Read, which was one of the big national reports on on reading in our um, country, the hand on the cave wall, always to say, I was here, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We use story to say, I was here. This is what I've experienced. This is who I am. And that is different than writing for other purposes, to persuade or to inform or to um, simply marvel at the beauty of the world in poetry, for example. Mm -hmm. We use story because it marks who we are and where we are. And if, if you haven't read Minds Made for Stories, it's this little short book, but one of his central claims is narrative is at the foundation of how we read and respond informationally and persuasively in texts, right? That narrative is actually an, a form that exists within all other forms. So of course we want kids to write a lot of narrative. <laughs> it's like the most essential. It, yes, it they flavors get every other thing. Yes. Yes. Besides, it's so much fun yeah. to get to know your story. <laughs> yes. Here. Well, we're coming toward the end of the interview, and I want to thank you for being one of my, as you call it, paperback mentors. And I want to ask <laughs> you a little bit about your paperback mentors. I'm sure everyone listening already has your books or is about to go and buy your books. But then what other books do you feel like are like the absolute essential reads that have shaped your um, teaching career? You know, I'm often, I often say the Dawns and the Toms um, <laughs> just because Don Graves and Don Murray, yeah. um, both I've read everything they've written. And um, if, if you're looking for kind of a starter um, book on from Donald Murray, learning by teaching, okay is amazing because it's a collection of articles he printed and most of them come from late sixties, early seventies about, um, like he has one called the listening eye, which is about conferring. And they're so beautiful. These little gems of understanding about how to teach writing as a process, not a series of products. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then Don Graves, of course, because of his emphasis on looking at children and his research into what happens if you teach even six-year-olds the conditions that writers work in and the process of writing and focus on that and let them lead. Um, and then for the Toms, Tom Romano, um, his work with multi-genre, one of his books, Writing with Passion, um, he is still actually this semester teaching at Miami University in Ohio, and he came to UNH and did his PhD here um, under Graves and Murray. And we've all kind of been friends always. Um, but Tom Romano has such a beautiful grasp of language and the excitement of being a writer. Um, I have a great picture of him holding up a draft and taking a picture to show me all the revisions he was making on it. Mm. Always in the process, always in a coffee shop working, um, many books. And then um, Tom Newkirk, as I mentioned, but I also can't um, walk away without saying the women, Linda Reef, Nancy Atwell, uh, Jane Hansen, um, Kylene Beers, and other people that I've come to know um, in this last section of my teaching career, they write about children and they write about the challenges of being a teacher. You know, Linda Reef just mm -hmm. retired after 40 years of teaching eighth graders. Yeah. That's expertise that's hard to match. Yeah. <laughs> so well, there are people that when I lived in Oregon and was teaching a small little elementary school, fifth graders, and somebody handed me Lucy Calkins and Don Graves, and I read Lessons from a Child, my favorite Lucy Calkins book, and was like, these are people that, that I wish I could sit around and talk to. That's a paperback mentor to me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what a wonderful list. Thank you for sharing it. I'm going to ask you for one more list because I just can't help myself. You have such an extensive um, set of experiences around helping students get excited about books, both as the head of the Book Love Foundation and as a master teacher of reading. And I just have to ask if a listener is, is going to start a classroom library today because they're inspired by this interview, what are some titles that you would put on their very first show? Oh, this is such a hard question. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let me tell you about some things I've read recently that I love. Okay. Um, so middle school, what about Will? Ellen Hopkins, who wrote um, these amazing books, mm -hmm. novels and verse for high school kids, has come out with her first book for a middle school um, reader, What About Will? And it's a young man who's um, he's a middle schooler. His older brother had a traumatic brain injury and is increasingly distant and kind of out of control in the household. And he's trying to figure out what to do. Mm -hmm. It's terrific. Mm -hmm. Couldn't stop reading. Red, White, and Whole, which I love. Um, Rajani LaRocca, she's a physician in a hospital down in Boston. And she's been mm -hmm. writing on the side for some time. And Red, White, and Whole is the story of being... Um, very much like the namesake, right? Her parents have come here to America from India, but the child has only been raised here in America. So there's this um, kind of a bit of a class clash culturally mm -hmm. with what the parents have experienced and what the child has experienced. But it's it's right at that middle school level, um, and so I just I it broke my heart and then mended it. So it's beautifully, beautifully done. Another favorite, if you don't know, A Wish in the Dark, which mm. is uh, it's a fantasy book that is two 10 year olds who are born in prison in a, a city that is much like Bangkok. And it is the two of them are in prison because their mothers were pregnant with them when they were um, taken there. And that has a little bit of a Les Miserables feel to it because the mothers were trying to um, get food for their families and were imprisoned because of stealing. Mm. And the boys want out. They're 10. One of them gets in a um, basket and escapes. And just that being tracked down and chased, it's got all kinds of the stuff that everyone wants to read. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, it's beautiful. It's exotic. And yet it is all plot driven story too. So kids are going to love it. So high school, um, I absolutely love me moth Amber McBride. It is a story of a girl whose family has been, uh, has died in a car accident and she's living with her aunt 
and she begins a cross country journey with this very spiritual young man who's um, indigenous. And the two of them are trying to work out all of these losses in their life as they move across the country. It's just beautifully written, haunting. You will want to read it yourself. Um, And I would also recommend a terrific um, National Book Award finalist from a few years ago, The Great Believers, Rebecca Mackay. And it's the story of the AIDS crisis in the 80s told through um, a narrator, Yale, who you are just so committed to understanding and following. And then as that's 1985, I believe, and then there's always this second story, which is the daughter of Yale's close friend who dies in the crisis, um, sorry, his sister, who's had a child and is looking for her child in Paris. So you have the, what are the 30 year later after effects of having been in that crisis? Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's, beautifully written, amazing book, but it's also just really, for me, an important um, way for us to think about what happened. Um, And then lastly, in order to live, um, Yonomi Park, which is the story of her escape from North Korea. And I mention it because um, I have a ninth grade social studies teacher here in my town who told me she liked this book, so we read it together, and she's now has all of her ninth graders reading it for her world cultures class, and they are just, just so engaged with learning about North Korea and the Gobi Desert and the flight to South Korea and China and the role of all these people. It's a tough book because she experiences the things that are happening to young women Um, you know, human trafficking and all kinds, but it's real. And these kids, I have a picture of them. She sent me from class where they're all just captivated reading. Those are good Mm -hmm. titles to start with any rate. Oh my gosh. Not only have I not read any of those titles, (laughs) I can't believe it, but I feel like I just got to listen in on a workshop for giving an exciting book talk. (laughs) (laughs) That's lots of practice. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So fun. Well, um, Penny, thank you so much for coming on. I know everyone listening is going to want to just dive in more deeply to your work. And I want to know where would you like them to connect with you first? Oh, my goodness. Um, So the Book Law Foundation, we give away grants to teachers, but we also have this vibrant professional learning piece. Um, So join our summer book club. We have We had teachers last year from 15 countries, 1,350 teachers were on the summer book club. And this year it will be on the Mighty Network um, instead of on Facebook. And we also have um, on my pennykittle.net site, you can see my speaking schedule. Um, My international work has been shut down since early 2020 when I first said I couldn't attend the Tokyo conference um, Mm -hmm. because of this new virus But I will be back around the world in other locations. Um, So hopefully at some point, if you check there, we can meet. Yes. Yes. Wonderful. Well, thank you again. Thank you. So, you know, continue your wonderful work. You're reaching so many people, Betsy. Before we go, it's time for this week's edition of The Scoop from Slovakia. First off, I want to thank this community for all your support for the Backpacks for Ukraine project. We were able to purchase and fill 40 backpacks for students and five extra backpacks with toys and art supplies for younger siblings. I heard a wonderful story of one little person who was running around at the backpack um, pickup site and saying, is there something for me? Is there something for me? Because he was too small to go to school and he saw one of our backpacks for the younger kids with a little stuffed animal peeking out the top and he was so thrilled. Um, So I just want you to know that that you are a part of that. Also, with the money left over, I'm now working with several groups to help provide clothing for newly arriving refugees and to help outfit an apartment that a new family is living in that so far only had mattresses. Together, we were able to raise over $10,000, and that money is truly making an immediate impact here. Everywhere I go in Bratislava, I see commitment 
for helping the Ukrainian people. There are Ukrainian flags waving from dozens of buildings and cars and buses. There are window displays in so many stores filled with blue and yellow items. Um, there's this famous sock store here called Fusakle, and they've come out with a line of socks with blue and yellow hearts on them, and the money goes to support Ukraine. Everyone is just like finding their own way to help, and it's really beautiful. When you walk through the old town at night, you see the Bratislava Castle lit up just completely in blue and yellow, and it's, it's very lovely. Everywhere you look, people are volunteering to help however they can, and it, honestly, it's inspiring to be part of such an uprising of love. And then at the same time, spring is coming to the city, as maybe it is where you are, and the flowers are blooming everywhere, and the air smells beautiful. Um, and I just feel like there's a lot to be grateful for. I'm honored to have been able to join with you on this project, and I just want to say thank you one more time. And that's The Scoop from Slovakia. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. I hope you're feeling inspired to experiment with some wonderful new ideas from Penny Kittle. Remember that you can visit the show notes at nowsparkcreativity.com and also find a wealth of free classroom resources there to help you on your creative path. Did you enjoy today's show? If you're in the mood, help me celebrate episode 150 by leaving a positive rating or review on your app or by sharing the episode with a friend. It's also a great time to subscribe so you don't miss any of the fabulous shows coming up next. Soon we'll have Jennifer Gonzalez from The Cult of Pedagogy and Jared Amato from Project Lit, and I don't want you to miss either of them. All right, my friend, until next time, take care of yourself and stay creative. <music>